Hi everyone and welcome to another video here at Tradewise. This is a Killer Whales special edition. So if you haven't already watched episode one of the Killer Whales TV show, then make sure you head over to tv.hello.one right now because the show is fantastic and you're not going to want to miss it. After winning the Killer Whale judges over and even getting one of them to support the project as an advisor, I wanted to learn more about Ape Water. So I caught up with the founders to talk to them in more detail about their vision for bringing water to Web3. This is certainly an exciting concept and I love the way they're using blockchain technology in what is basically the oldest industry on the planet, which is supplying water. If you like the sound of what they're doing, then show your support by giving this video a thumbs up. And if you're new to this channel, don't forget to subscribe to stay up to date with other promising projects from the Killer Whale Show, as well as other projects that I've got my eye on here on Tradewise. And with that being said, let's see what the Ape Water team had to say. Okay, so hi guys, uh, and congratulations, first of all, on your huge success on the first ever edition of Killer Whales. What was the experience like, and um, how did it feel when you first kind of stepped up there in front of the, the panel of Killer Whales? Um, Andrew, do you want to take this one? Yeah, sure. Um, it was quite exhilarating and we had a benefit, uh, I think, against other contestants in that we had provided the entire uh, cast and crew water ahead of the show. So when we walked in there, there was a little sense in the air that there was something special brewing because people had already established some goodwill towards the brand. So we could feel that energy in the air. People already were aware of the product. They were experiencing the product. And so we just felt like we were floating the entire time. It was, it was quite an experience. Great. And, and yeah. watching the, you know, the way it was is edited and things, it was fascinating because uh, at first it seemed as though with your pitch, the, the, the panel weren't necessarily on board straight away. I, I feel like some of them were, were, were a bit kind of against it at, at first. But then suddenly the, the tide turns. So how how did it feel um, when uh, when I think it was Ram that had the kind of aha moment where he's saying, okay, it's not just this isn't just water. You're selling experiences as well. So uh, what was going through your minds at that point in time when when you start when you start to think, okay, yeah, these guys actually start to get it now. Yeah, um, you know these things can always be quite intimidating. We had experienced this time and time again uh, for the previous year developing the brand where. You never would associate water and Web3, you know, those two things don't necessarily, you know, collide well together. But we figured out this unique <clears throat> thing and we felt quite confident as if they continued to be uh, inquisitive and ask questions that we would be able to turn them around. And then when we were able to ultimately have that aha moment, as you say, um, we, we knew that we were in a good position to win the favor of the whales. Great. Yeah. And then obviously um, it went fantastically well from there. I think just one by one, you could see the oldest have those that, that epiphany. So how did it feel, I suppose, at the end when it was all over to have got so much support and backing from them all? Well, I'll just jump in one sec. It was great when they started arguing against each other, really, <laughs> on the show, because they were defending our own concept for us as well, which was just something that, as Andrew mentioned, we've encountered a lot of going into these early stage meetings before we actually had truly showing the brand to people and started building it. Once you have that first five minutes of engagement with someone and they get past the cutiness of it, they recognize what the actual business is. They start telling you about the brand before you get a chance to tell them what the, you know, you're right. That's exactly what we're thinking. This is how we're seeing it. And people start selling us the business model, <clears throat> which is just really unique because it is such a unique piece of um, IP, unique concept and people start taking ownership of it. And it was fun to see the judges go through that. Um, but yeah, just to answer your question, it was another notch of, of, of um, satisfaction and I guess gratitude that we have for people recognizing that people of such stature have gone through such you know, successful businesses to recognize something unique in what we've done. And it's a bit of, um, you know, Andrew and I are confident with what we're doing, but it's always great to have that recognition from peers, specifically of the stature that are in the room, to recognize what we've done and to give us that kudos was a pretty cool feeling. And, and just to uh, bounce off of that, in respect to the confidence, it was based upon how we went about bringing the product to market. For example, we chose to do spring water over tap water. Everyone told us just do tap water, water doesn't matter, but we went to great lengths to source some of the best water on earth. So experientially, people are drinking the water. We already know we're giving them an A plus experience. Even the can itself, we could have done a cheap plastic wraparound, which is what most 
companies do early on. We did direct to metal printing to give you a really bespoke premium experience. So we just knew the more you experience the product because we went through the efficacy of making sure that we could deliver the best experience, that those things start to build good goodwill because it's overt. The, the, the product really does a lot of the heavy lifting for us. Yeah. Fantastic. So we'll come on to the product in just a second. Um, but when was the, f the show actually uh, filmed? When was it filmed? I think it was September last year from memory. Um, it was around October, September. It was a bit of a blur. We're going through a little bit of a growth spurt in our in business. So we had a lot of internal um, focuses that we were on. And then we got told to come to a TV show, which we just couldn't believe we were actually going to be on. And then we're sitting in the trailer and going, how we get here? What are we, what are, what's, what's, what are they asking of us? What's the next step? And it was kind of a really surreal experience, but I, I would think it was that September, October, if I'm correct. Okay. So s since then, how have things kind of uh, progressed since, since your experience on the show? Um, it's been incredible. Um, we have gone through another round of investment. We've secured some funding beyond our pre-seed into our seed round, which is helping us ex execute on a lot of the marketing and growth strategies we have to actually become a mass market product in, in the US to start with. Um, and then again, we've we've had onboarded some new team members, so that's been fantastic as well. But also just the growth within our model of our business and how we're shifting our focus to where we want to really target the the youth um, market and how we want to do that through the different you know um, verticals within our business. It's become really very really strategically and very very focused for us to do, and that all came post that um, that um, interview program with the Killer Whales. Yeah, the business has really matured since we were originally first on the show. We now see, a, you know, new marketplaces for us to share the water, which also will spread Web3 and educate a whole new audience, as Itai mentioned, through youth sports. We're also rolling out retail now, too, so we've signed distribution deals. We're currently in Nevada, launching Colorado, and an expansion into the West Coast as well, too. So very quickly, we've gone from being a direct-to-consumer brand online to now being a legitimate CPG brand on the show at American retail stores yeah brilliant so let's um, let's sort of take a step back just for a moment then for anyone who's not watched the show and by the way if you haven't watched the show make sure you do jump over onto the uh, either the hello uh, lab streaming platform or you'll be able to catch it very soon on some mainstream uh, uh, streaming platforms as well but for anyone who hasn't seen the show um, let's talk a little bit just about the water then you did uh, mention um, briefly earlier about the, the sort of quality of the water etc but where did the actual original idea come from for this product Oh, wow. Uh, you might need more <laughs> to, uh, I'll, I'll try and be as, as succinct as possible. So Etai and I met during the pandemic and my background is hospitality, music. Uh, I own a nightclub. I was a touring DJ. I was making records and um, the pandemic looked like it had no end in sight. And so I equated it for myself as I felt like I was the band on the Titanic and didn't feel like a good place to be. And so I was looking and seeking some other opportunities. I was connected with Etai as we were exploring a um, sanitizer deal to just help during the pandemic with various solutions. And in that insight, we realized we weren't, you know, creating sanitizer solutions. We were bottling plastic. And that was the initial impetus of let's look for non-plastic solutions. And as we went on that journey, we had this insight that really water is this undervalued commodity. Um, in the world, a lot of people don't, understand, especially in the U.S., don't even understand the different nuances of the water they're drinking, the packaging the water comes in. And we also have this incredible affinity for Web3 and crypto and decentralization. And with the success of Board Ape Yacht Club, which was having this incredible moment culturally with some of the biggest celebrities and sports athletes and uh, figureheads all joining together in, in this solidarity of sorts of saying we all are you know, pro crypto, pro NFTs. We saw the word ape as being this incredible word of value that didn't just represent Port Ape Yacht Club, but really the essence of Web3 and crypto as a whole. So you ape in to Bitcoin, you ape into Ethereum, you ape into Web3 decentralization, you ape into Springwater. And so it was mid-January of 2022, Etai and I just decided on a whim, maybe we should trademark the word ape for beverage non-alc. Uh, uh, specifically in the category category of water and all water derived products. And when we were able to secure the trademark, we knew we had something really special. And from there, we started to explore how to best approach, bring a product to market that can be a way to bridge 
the digital world of Web3 with the physical world and what better way through water, water's life. And so uh, we aspire to be a Gatorade of sorts for Web3, the way Gatorade is a beverage of sports. And uh, yeah, just we, you know, through, I guess, just maybe a degree of uh, hubris, uh, because taking on beverage is not for the faint of heart. We uh, ended up finding a prop market fit and uh, here we are. Terrific. Yeah, the um, the killer whales certainly seem to enjoy drinking it, and, and I definitely want to focus um, on the Web3 side in just a moment. But um, you, you mentioned there, you know, you, you're going into a very, very competitive marketplace. Um, what makes the, just, just think about the water alone, um, first of all, what makes the, the water sort of unique? What, what are you sort of most proud of when it comes to the actual um, physical products itself? So we've coined the phrase spring to table. When you historically look at water, premium water, the source of the water is always, you know, the main distinguishing factor of a brand. For example, Evian, which was one of the first water brands to really kind of become ubiquitous as a premium lifestyle brand with, with running and jogging in the 1980s, comes from the French Alps. Or Fiji, which is a really popular brand, comes from Fiji. And so as supply chains had, were um, compromised during COVID and essentially realizing that black swan events could happen any moment, we realize that the narrative of water being trucked across the Atlantic or Pacific from a particular source doesn't really make sense to the values of Gen Z, Gen Alpha. And so we want to really secure the best local springs that allow us to um, ultimately, you know, spread around the country and not have to um, uh, drive truck water all around, which, which changes the business model quite dramatically. So that was one of the first foundational aspects of the business. And then also plastic. You can find the best water in the world, but if it's packaged in plastic, it's already compromised. And so we knew we wanted sustainability. We knew we wanted non-plastic and we knew we wanted to work with local springs, local supply chains in order to really deliver the best product for the values of the next generation. The logic behind the spring to table model that we've, we've tried, we're engaged with is shaking up the industry. So we have a mandate where we choose a specific um, mineral specific mineral balances that we want to work with. So we are identifying springs that we really want to work with across the country. Um, and that will impact the communities that we're, we're serving. So we try not to truck water across from the east, west coast to the east coast. There may be instances where it's done, but the, the as we expand, the idea is to actually capitalize on those springs for those markets. So we are not redu we're reducing our carbon footprint. So as in like an ESG kind of consideration, as we expand, we really want to be a really uh, environmentally friendly business and focus and that we think as we expand, that's going to have a bigger impact on the buyer's decision-making process, the, the um, Gen Z market, as well as we grow into a you know, 20, 30 year legacy business, we're going to have as little impact on the environment as possible. So thinking long-term about it as well. And it really ties into the idea of our ape consciousness. We want this to be a re-evolution. Apes, you know, would think local, they wouldn't understand the concept of shipping water and shipping containers across the country. So it really also emphasizes the spirit of the brand eight and us all identifying with the, that, um, that, that being a, a core identity of our business of aping in to sustainability as well too. Fantastic. And um, will it just be water? Is, is that the, the plan long-term or do you, do you see yourselves maybe um, diversifying into like other, other beverages? That's a great question. So we view ourselves foundationally as a water company where we want to be the next generation's water where Fiji and Evian focus just on water. We will always focus on adding additional complementary um, uh, verticals that support the water, such as hydration or merchandise, for example. But we really want to celebrate water. And that's core and fundamental to our business. We feel if we uh, diversified and start expanding to other beverages that that would convolute our core mission. Okay, sure, understood. And for someone that's uh, watching this video that, that's keen to um, to have their first try, uh, where can they actually go and buy the water? So there's two ways. We were the first company that I'm aware of that allowed people to purchase water uh, direct to consumer using crypto. So if you go to drinkthefuture.xyz, you could purchase our water with Ethereum or ApeCoin or if you go to apebeverages.com, you could buy as well on that and uh, select retailers in the United States. 
All right, sounds good. So I really want to focus now on the Web3 side of it because I'm really fascinated by how this is all going to work. So I have a rough idea from watching the show how this kind of intertwines, but would you perhaps explain in your own words, how, how does water uh, merge and, and, and overlap into Web3? Think of it as the Happy Meal box where people might be going to McDonald's for a burger, fries, and a soda, but really the toy is what drives the Happy Meal. And for us, when you scan the can, we're giving you great spring water and we're giving you sustainability, but scanning the can unlocks Web3 and unlocks digital prizes that are geofenced with a time and place so we can really gamify the consumer experience and reward them for hydrating. And so that's really the foundational component of the can and that's when it unlocks Web3 features and the gamification can ensue in terms of being scavenger hunts we can create AR experiences at live events, at retailers, and, and essentially anything that you could do on a Web3 NFT blockchain, we now can offer the consumer with as minimal friction as possible because one of the key distinctions of the way we're positioning the brand is we are positioning it where the consumer doesn't necessarily need to understand blockchain, doesn't need to understand NFT. They're just experiencing it the way when you listen to a song on Spotify, you don't know it's an MP3, you just know you had access to a song in real time. And so really the usability to onboard the masses into Web3 is a core uh, uh, mission of our brand to make NFTs more ubiquitous in the culture without necessarily having to really understand the technology side underneath it. Well, I'm certainly a big fan of anything that can onboard people into Web3 because I feel like for many years, I mean, I've been in crypto for um, six or seven years now, and it's felt like it's very raw technology. It feels like it's not very user friendly. So I love the idea that you can just get a can, you know, scan it on your phone and suddenly you're kind of immersed in, in Web3 almost instantaneously. So so if I'm actually scanning, um, I presume it's like a QR code or something on on the can, what will, will I? Will everyone that scans automatically get a uh, get an NFT? Will, will, is, is that the way it will work? What, what's the actual process? So once I've scanned, what will happen uh, in the next part of the journey for me? Yeah. So when you scan the can, um, you'll be going through a two point five wallet experience. So a wallet would be created initially, and then um, you would get an NFT, what we call a digital prize, just to demystify it a bit immediately. So you're always rewarded. And then we're going to have multiple digital prizes that be, can be earned at particular times and places. You can get push notifications as well. But ultimately, you could always claim a prize. We never want to uh, have that initial experience be something where people don't understand and, and, and get that first initial dopamine hit of getting their first NFT. And so uh, we want to reward people instantaneously an analogy we like to use too is uh, the Cracker Jack box, which every Cracker Jack box comes with a prize. Every ape water comes with a digital prize. And what might these digital prizes be then? So will they be like limited edition in any way? What will they kind of look like? The art style, etc. What's What's the actual um, gift going to, to be? Great question. So our cans are always changing aesthetically. And with every new can we release, we will release a new digital prize along with it. So there is scarcity okay. as there's limited edition for every release. Great, so so actually, as the can evolves, as uh, so too does the actual NFT itself. Exactly. Yeah, and there's some secret sauce that's gonna be developing in the next you know, 12 to 16, 18 months that we're putting together that we would release that exciting kind of new step that would happen off the can as well that will provide more clarity around the opportunity of experiences and um, prizes as well. Sorry, without giving too much away, the idea is drink to earn and the prizes stack. And so the more you drink, the more you earn. Yeah. And uh, we really want to gamify the experience as much as possible. And we're really excited to debut a lot of these new features. We, um, you know, we want to be tight lipped about it because we do feel it's uh, quite a unique play in which we're doing it. And uh, this should ultimately want to have the youth and our core audience drink more water at the end of the day. So we want to increase water consumption, that's our core mission. And so we want to gamify that as much as possible and make sure that the rewards continue to stack um, and uh, people are excited in the process. I really love this, this idea because um, like my, I've got young children myself, you know, you got, when you're saying about uh, Happy Meals, et cetera, you know, I can, I can definitely relate to that. They want to get the toy 
and the food kind of is, is secondary really to it. Um, and I also love the fact that you've got the collectible element of it. I, I can really see if say you've got um, like a range of NFTs that's um, maybe 20 different NFTs in this collection, I can really see how people are going to be keen to, to complete the set. They're going to want all 20, right? So, you know, um, how, how do you see this going in terms of perhaps a marketplace where if I've, I may have, say, four of the same, uh, the same NFT and I want to trade that off with, say, someone that's got one of, one of the missing ones uh, so I can complete the set. Do you see it like that way? It's kind of trading like a bit like with baseball cards and that kind of thing. That's a great question. So we have our own marketplace where you could trade your NFTs with your friends. And so you can certainly swap. And to your point, Jonathan, if you have that one NFT your friends don't have, you can see how fun it could be to barter and determine how to make a swap. And and that's where some of the fun ensues because now you're having community and sharing with friends and uh, it's financially approachable. And so it, it's able to create that reward system, that community um, without a lot of friction for let's say a young person who might have limited resources. Sounds great. And um, what's the infrastructure behind this? Have you partnered with um, any, any chain, blockchains or, or any other kind of partners in the Web3 space? So originally we, uh, we've tested several chains. We've tested a smaller chain called Lightlink, which is a layer two. We've also done Polygon as well and we really view ourselves as chain agnostic and potentially exploring multi-chain as well too. Our core partner that we're working with is MagicLink and they work with all the major chains. And so um, we're still, and I don't wanna announce which chains we're going to be launching with for our next iteration, um, but ultimately we wanna make sure that it's frictionless as possible. And it's not so much the underlying technology which uh, the consumer is focused on, but more so the experience. And so there's various chains that offer different benefits and to uh, the consumer experience, and that's what we're gonna optimize for primarily. And so yeah. talking about roadmap then, um, what what do you see happening? What's what's on the roadmap for the next six to 12 months? Uh, so the next six to 12 months is all about distribution and creating as much access to the water domestically in the United States. So we're targeting 2,500 retailers before end of year conservatively and that number can get as high as 10,000 it just depends on the cadence and how gracefully uh, we're able to expand the distribution um, because it's physical goods we want to measure twice cut once and so uh, we, we feel quite confident that 2,500 retail stores before end of year is is a conservative number and uh, we'll, we'll shoot for much higher Itai, I don't know if there's anything else in the next six to 12 months you think would be. Uh... No, I think that from a, from a business perspective, yeah, that's the that's our number. 2,500 is just the very conservative, effective number that we can hit on the West Coast, um, then expand into the East Coast as well with the different springs. Um, but then on top of that is just our marketing outreach. Um, you'll start reckoning seeing us out in typical socials, um, doing our strategic deployments of our, I guess, guerrilla marketing campaigns that we are going to start deploying. So a lot of the stuff that we've been working on in the background now for 2024 is going to start coming to light over the next six to 12 months. So we'll be not only a Web3 project, but really a, a mass market um, product for consumers. So we can then onboard people into the into the ecosystem through the can. Now, we, uh, we paused our social media a while back as we really have a robust strategy to reintroduce the product as we scale retail. So uh, yeah, a very aggressive social media campaign across all various channels of TikTok, Instagram, et cetera. And that will be core to our business. We really want to make our water, uh, a, we, we view water as an ape beverages as a fun experience through shared experiences. Sorry, if making water, let me rephrase that, I apologize. Our goal is to make water fun through shared experiences and that's gonna be reflected in our social media. And so uh, we're really excited to um, show everyone quite short, uh, shortly what we're doing to uh, make this the most exci exciting water brand on the, in, the, in, uh, in the world. All right, and so I noticed that you've also mentioned uh, a number of times uh, throughout the conversation about kind of targeting the youth uh, market. Why specifically have you gone for that sector? Yeah, thanks for answering, asking that question, Jonathan. It's, it was a big pivot for us as we expanded beyond kind of the initial core focus of being the beverage of Web3. 
we feel like we got a lot of voice and got heard through the community and got really supported by the community. But as we want to expand and make this a real, you know, mass product, we had to find a target audience that was going to be able to scale with us. Um, there's an insight that I'll let Andrew share the story about. But the core insight internally from a mission and mission statement was we saw that the caffeinated beverages and the sports drinks that had a lot of sugar were the few, like the front-facing brands that were targeting the youth to go and stay hydrated when they were playing sports and playing activities. And we felt we had the tr- the best and most fun hydration p- opportunity for the youth, which was just water in a can that they really wanted to go after. Um, and we had that proven out through a little pilot program we were able to achieve later, early, mid last year in July. And um, from that, that really kind of catapulted us in this direction of the youth market. And I'll let Andrew kind of kind of summarize how we, you know, ended up there as well. Yeah, we were the water for the Little League World Series in San Diego, where we were actually the water in the dugout during the games. And the kids took an immediate liking to the product. They weren't aware what a board API club was, which was the, is the image on the can. They didn't know what an NFT was. They just really thought the product was cool and they loved getting digital prizes. And that was a big insight for us where, as Etai mentioned, sugar and caffeinated beverages have targeted the youth, but no one was really targeting the youth from a water perspective. And that was the white space. And that really is the future of Web3, the future of crypto, is creating a way to educate these people these young, these young uh, student athletes, um, when they're young, and on ramp them into Web three. So we feel we are going to educate the next generation and bring them in to the Web three NFT sphere. And we're really excited to be the ones leading the charge on that. Well, as a as a father, I, again, I can definitely relate to this because you know if I ask my kids what they want to drink, you know what they're going to ask for. They're going to ask for fizzy drinks a lot of the time, pop, and so you know see adverts and things. There's, there's very little representation really that, that makes them think that drinking water is kind of good or cool or fun, you know? Yeah. So I, I, I think this idea, I really it really speaks to me personally and I think it will also speak to a lot of parents out there as well. But it sounds like also the kids are already sort of on board with it as well from from um, from the kind of market research and, and from uh, from the way you've kind of utilized the, the product so far as well. So it sounds really exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. We didn't we didn't see it coming and it was one of those things where it showed up and we were just responding with grace. And so we're so excited to be able to have this core audience to um and again it feels really good to buy them water given the alternative. So thanks, Jonathan, for sharing your story with us too. That means a lot. Yeah, it does. It resonates. We um obviously targeting the kids, but when it comes to the parents actually being the purchaser, they recognize that we are not just trying to sell the kids something that's gonna be a deterrent, but something that's going to up, you know, lift them up and actually give them really true support and they'll have a smile on their face while they consume it as well. Yeah, fantastic. Well, I wish you every success. Congratulations again on uh, on doing so well on the Killer Whale show. And uh, I'm definitely going to be uh, keenly watching. Can't wait for you to come over to the UK with the product as well uh, in the future. So thanks for joining me today. And as I say, best of luck for the future, guys. Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. Thanks for having us on. Appreciate it. Thank you, John. I hope you enjoyed that review of Ape Water. I certainly think that what they're doing is super exciting and I wish them every success in the future. Don't forget, if you want to stay up to date on the best projects from the Killer Whale Show, as well as other exciting projects as I find them, then subscribe to my channel so you don't miss any future content. Also, please remember to hit that like button on your way out. Thanks a lot for watching and I'll see you next time.